One person's fact, somebody else's fiction. It's hardly new, but is it more relevant now than it ever has been? Is the truth becoming more distorted from reality? We are told by some that we're living in a post-truth world, but is that in itself anything new? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Post-truth, they say that is when information that appeals to the emotions and personal beliefs is more influential than the actual fact. And we do live in an age where information is constantly streamed to phones, TVs, computers from so many different sources. It is difficult to know what is rooted in the truth and what is not. Are lies dressed as truth, reshaping our world? Or has post-truth always been a reality? will make America great again. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our independence day. Underestimated outcomes that have divided the world and in their wake forced us to question what is real. Because the people have been lied to. And what is not. Fake, fake, fake news. Does the rise of Donald Trump and the UK's decision to leave the European Union herald a new era where truth is lost in the noise. When promises are hollowed out by the hysteria, facts manipulated to affect change, are we living in a post-truth world? Post-truth is when emotional appeals are more influential in shaping public opinion than objective facts. Riding on the coattails of populism politics, post-truth was the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year last year. But in an age when it's never been easier to check facts, how have we ended up in a place where falsities and half-truths have become the reality? £350 million pounds a week and spend on our priorities here in this country, including on the National Health Service. Have facts become the victim in the crossfire between new politicians and the establishment? But I'm president and they're not. Between press secretaries and the mainstream media. Challenged by one side, branded as fake news or alternative facts by the other. Or have they been drowned in the sea of information available to us online? Our beliefs, whether based in fact or not, reinforced through complex algorithms and spread throughout our social networks. In a world with 24-hour news and a wealth of information at our fingertips, separating fact from fiction is becoming increasingly difficult. In the post-truth world, there is no stable, verifiable reality. Just an endless battle to define it. It may be a recent buzzword, but is it a new concept? Online, on our screens, or at the ballot box? Have we always ignored facts if they contradict our beliefs? And if so, who is to blame? Join us for today's round table from Washington, D.C. Mika Mosbacher, author and Republican. She says social media and the Internet are responsible for spreading false information and untruths. Max Goldman from Sense About Science, who says the truth is often politicized to score political points. The journalist George Brock has been a professor of journalism at City University. Steve Fuller, immediately to my left, author of the book Post Truth, Knowledge as a Power Game, and also at the table TV and marketing executive Frank Radis, who has worked with Mr. Trump on The Apprentice, and he says journalists need to market themselves better. Thank you, every one of you, for joining us on Roundtable. Let me come to you, first of all, uh, George Brock, and, and say, look, Post Truth, if you want to put a label on it, is nothing new. In effect, it is a form of propaganda, but something new is happening. And I'm not sure what that is. What do you believe it is? Digital technology, in, a, in two words, 
Digital technology makes it much easier to copy stuff. It makes it harder to know where it comes from. It makes everyone a journalist if they want to be. Anyone with a smartphone can now publish something. And that changes the game and the rules and the scope of everything, and it makes it much, much harder to know what is true. And for journalism, that's a gigantic challenge. And, and has it all been put into focus by Donald Trump's victory in the United States? Oh, absolutely. And I think the use of his use of digital uh, technology has been one of the things. But I take it... Uh, uh, a different position, that it's not the digital technology that, it's, that is the problem, it is the digital technology that is the, the thing that allows the problem to propagate. And uh, so I, I, I don't think it's the digital technology in and of itself. Well, technology is neutral, that, that is reasonable, but it provide, all I was trying to say was it, it provides an opportunity. Because of it. Uh, more people are able to do things that they've never been able to do before. Exactly. I think exactly. So. But I do think part of what you're pointing to is just democratization. Uh, in other words, uh, when you talk about the, the prevalence of digital technology and the ability for people to become their own journalists and so forth, you're talking about the possibility of, peop of more people than ever before being involved in the production and distribution of knowledge. And that itself, I think, for a lot of the traditional journalistic community is the problem. Well, it's I, not right. just not, but it's yeah. not no, knowledge. But it is the, that is the problem to a large extent, because traditionally, when we've talked about the truth, we've talked about it coming from relatively few channels, right? The idea of broadcasting initially was a few sources spreading out in many ways, but now we have a much more distributed way in which news is being presented, and that is a feature of democratization, okay. let, 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 and people need to live with that. Let us bring in Mika, uh, because you've been part of the Republican National Convention. Yes. You work closely on the election, and I think the consensus here is that Trump made it sexy alternative the truth, the post-truth alternative facts, but effectively what he did was he said, liar, liar, pants on fire to everybody else, I'm the only one telling the truth. Exactly, and, and truly, if you look at this, and we go back and look at this from an emotional, lo logical, uh, logical position in this country, it was very clear that Trump was entertaining. He said things that were sort of P.T. Barnum, you know, gladiators on stage during the debate. He was absolutely larger than life. He'd been a household word for 30 years. And people tuned in like a modern day Game of Thrones. Did they believe 100% of the campaign rhetoric? No, but they didn't care because he painted this optimistic, positive picture about what this country could look at. And I think the election was a referendum against uh, Hillary Clinton and also Obama. And quite frankly, Hillary's message was boring. So my, my and she yeah. was you were able ahead to depict I, well, I, her I, as more dishonest. I can agree with a lot of that. I think a lot of uh, academics, experts, took the, the referendum result, uh, Trump's victory, yeah. as almost a sort of personal vote against them, as against expertise. I don't think it was, was that at all. Yeah. I don't think we can take from uh, what happened in 2016 that the US, the UK public uh, don't want the truth or, or aren't interested in the truth. These votes happened for other reasons, perhaps lack of confidence in the uh, establishment as it was, or whatever the reason was. It wasn't because people suddenly yeah. abandoned truth or, or, or the desire for, for tr trustworthiness. I think the key to what Mika was saying was that people just yeah. didn't care. Uh, and, I mean, if you, and I also think, though, that right. you, know, you were talking about the dissemination of, of uh, and that knowledge. And Trump. Trump. Yes. Yeah. Trump is just taking advantage yeah. of something that's already been there for at least the last 20 years since the advent of the Internet and yeah. people being able to find alternative sources of information. I, I think it's even before that. And, but, I, and no, I also but, but, So it's not new. I mean, yeah. it's which you can't hang it all on Trump. Trump is just a guy well, who actually I sees what's going he on. He made it sexy. He made yeah. it mainstream. I mean, well, that was the, the marketing. thousands of years, and we're talking about simply propaganda, aren't we? No, we're not no. just talking about propaganda, no, because... Uh, you, you rightly said it's, it's been democratized. Yes, that's the key but, point. But we've also discovered there's a downside to this democratization. Not all information is of equal value. Well, that's why people didn't want to democratize originally, right? Walter well, Lippmann. No, no, no. Right, right. We go back to the history of journalism, the, the, the right? Demo the democratization, oh, the is, democratization is irreversible. But okay. we can't treat everything that everyone says so as of equal do we value. Do? Well, that what do we do? Journalists well, try to say, <laughs> journalists try to say, I, I'm going to show you my workings. I'm going to show you my evidence. Let's hope you believe it. 
Well, look at what Facebook's trying to do right now with, with setting up a sort of a, a journalistic knowledge area so that there's some kind of fact checking going on. I actually don't th I think it's a great thing that they're trying to do that, but I don't think it can work. No, it's I think te big. technical fixes might, might be a part of it with, with, the, with the social media platforms, but I think there are two big things that uh, people can do, can do, particularly people who consider themselves experts or people who are producers of official knowledge. They can actually take a look at themselves and ask themselves, why does there seem to have been this kind of crisis of confidence or lack of trust? I think a lot of experts or people who, who consider themselves to be uh, 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 broadcasters of the truth assume that they uh, deserve trust, whereas actually you have to earn trust. You have to prove yourself trustworthy to the public. And that is something that the sort of traditional media sources, traditional sources of authority, have to do a bit of self-searching on that. And an organization yes. like mine yeah, well, tries to help them do that. This, this, is back, this is true. In at this point, um, in, in terms of yeah. the, the debate we're having here, I suppose most people around the table would consider themselves to be thinkers, if not necessarily deep thinkers. <laughs> we think about things. But the vast majority of people don't stop to consider things as deeply. Um, as that, they just accept oh, or they don't on. accept. Come on, come on. Don't be patronizing. No, I don't want to be patronizing, but the vast majority of people do, do not have time for that. Mika. To some degree, this election was an escape. Um, people were concerned about feeding their families, and, and Trump understood that the uh, GOP establishment, and I was part of the establishment, kind of went through a 12-step program to wean myself <laughs> from politics as usual. Trump understood. He understood that the message was no longer resonating with the base. And he ran as an outsider, which is interesting because even Bill Clinton and Obama ran as elite outsiders. They were running against the establishment. and. Uh, this resonated with American people, and they were tuning into debates. I was surprised at the number of young people who couldn't wait to get home or they DVR'd a debate. Okay, so and perhaps I'm totally wrong, and were people do consider these things count. much more deeply than I imagine they do, and forgive me if that, that was a patronizing I, I, They just reach I, different conclusions. Well, yeah. Yeah. The I, two I, conclusions are based on what? I think that's a very benevolent way of looking at it. I think what you have in America is a fracture between two sets of people who don't agree about how you establish truth. And that's a really bad situation to be in. We're not that far from it here in the UK. We've had those kinds of arguments about Brexit and so on. But if you, have, yeah. if you lose your sense of collective reality and you fail to agree about how you establish what's true, I'd say you were in a bad place. But Does knowledge matter? I mean, it's come up twice. It does, but it's how knowledge. you weight yes, the evidence. Matters. How you weight mm. the evidence. And what you yep. consider important. I yes. Mean, mm. there, there, is, there are no such things as alternative facts. I hope we can agree that. But clearly, there is an, uh, an objective truth, and science and evidence is sort of a way of trying to get clo as close to that truth as we can. Mm -hmm. But within that, there is huge space for people to have completely different lives and understandings of the same facts. And that I think this democratization yes. of no, no, the no. media has really opened okay. that up. And, uh, yeah. but you, you make, you make a right. good point about that science. Everybody has to like, agree. I'm not saying no, no, that everybody sure. has to agree. But you make a good People point about science. I think time. I want to steer this but they debate stuff with a foundation about how you establish about what might be right. how people are, are using this. Talk about the troll factories in the United mm. States. Talk I about the marketing lost of, trust. of Donald Trump. How, how are we seeing this being used by powerful politicians? Yes. I think, I mean, there is a huge space now, and this is the biggest worry that I have, that people uh, talk about a post-truth world. It's not that the public is post-truth, but there is a danger that politicians and, and other people in authority will internalize this idea of the public as post-truth, and that opportunists, uh, not to name names, will take advantage of that and get short-term gain in, in, in really sort of uh, uh, exploiting this idea that people don't want well, truth and facts when they do. One of the things that are happening is there are a number of very powerful actors, state actors in some cases, Russia would be an example, trying to blur people's idea of how you establish what's, what's true. And if you can blur that, you can create a great deal. Well, of you can create that blur through reach and frequency of single messaging. So an example of that might be that the Environmental Protection Agency is no longer saying that there is climate change. They have been told to say that there is extreme weather conditions. So you say that over and over and over again, a lot of people are gonna say there's no climate change. And that's one of the problems because now, the President of the United States has not only the bully pulpit, but he's got this Twitter account that 
goes directly to these people constantly, yes, over and over again, with this same single message. And that is a is an understanding of how to utilize marketing to get a message across to make people change but in, their minds. But in an open democracy, you're going to allow the president to communicate with the people, aren't you? Yes. I'm not suggesting not that, it, that you don't allow him to do it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there's a, a masterful use of it. Well, but he actually does it in a in a channel, Twitter, where people potentially can say things in response, and they do. And do. Right? And so you get a kind of running sense of how people are responding to everything he says, and he probably takes that pretty seriously. So in this respect, we're getting a kind of democratization we've never seen before between the elected leaders and the people who elected them. And it, I think it, his trust, trust levels are falling because of that. About perhaps. Perhaps. Journalists, and look those of us around leads. this table, feeling that we've lost some influence, perhaps? I think, yeah, there has been yes. a loss of influence of, of elites, of the establishment of traditional sources of authority, and that clearly there are dangers in that, but we can't lose the good side of that or what, or what we've gained. <coughs> and I think those, who, who, those of us who, who would defend the idea of, of there being established facts, objective truths, of the value of experts and institutions and all these things, uh, we have to look at how we can earn that trust back, not just complain that the trust is gone. If you create much, much, much more information and journalism is a smaller chunk of all that well, information circulating in the world. Journalists are bound to feel exactly. they're, they're playing a smaller role. And I think Which is Mika, exactly what's happening. Uh, exactly, and I think Mika wanted to make a point uh, on, on that very subject. Yes. I, well, I did because, first of all, look at the fact that he is able to dominate and control the news cycle with yes. a single tweet. Exactly. Look how he started a feud with General Sessions he was able to sort of pull a switch and bait and get the uh, and help people divert attention away from the Russian collusion and the Mueller investigation. And he kept that uh, feud going with Sessions for several days. Until and Session, I think a lot of people within Sessions the administration dropped. wondered was it what's really, yeah. Well, until Sessions went ahead and did exactly, what he wanted Sessions him to do, which isn't going to make any difference. What session says will not make any difference. No, it wasn't going to make any difference. <laughs> Where are we going from no. here? How, it's but not the to change, difference is it? was, is he was able to control the news cycle. He was okay. able to control the news cycle. We, we can't put I, this I think we can. Look at CNN today. They're talking about the pro-Trump bot, pro-Trump 45, <laughs> a Russian bot tweet. <laughs> yeah, Russian. That yeah. came out this morning, and Trump has been interacting with it because but, it's a positive message. And nobody and cares. And it's creating news. Nobody so cares. why are we talking about Mueller and the investigation? No, we're talking about tweeting. But this is white noise, isn't it? I mean, it's just out yeah. there d distracting people, but while well, the real work is it going is on elsewhere. Noise. And it get yes, and there's short-term benefit perhaps. For, for people to generate that white noise, but it won't last forever. I think the truth, the truth comes out. And, but this and is the thing that's interesting. It'll depend what happens, where, where we are a year from now, what we will say about this episode. Mm. Because it's easy to say now, oh, this is white noise, the truth will prevail. But this is faith. You're talking oh, well, faith here. No, okay. I, mean, I, mean, sorry, I can't prove it, obviously. I mean, it's, but it's not faith. It's based may be on the new look of, me of, of media coverage. I mean, this is the point. You actually don't know it. No, this I don't know. Obviously, I, don't I know. think I that short term in this case is three and a half years. Yeah. Well, minimum. I can't predict that, but yeah. what you can see is that in the past that every generation has to have its new learning how to deal with new media, literacy of one kind yes. or another. People learn how to read newspapers. Back in the 18th century, people had to learn how to read political pamphlets. With, social media is very new. We're all sort of children with it. And I think yeah. there is a, and organizations like mine that try and help people be more critical of, of information sources, but actually have the literacy to ask the right questions and yeah. to filter out some of that white noise. I think each, it is time possible. There's a, each time, I don't think I'm each being totally anorist for saying that's Each time there's a new form of communication, you get chaos, everybody goes, it's absolutely wonderful. And the next moment they panic and go, it's absolutely terrible. And then the everybody work. kind of settles down. We haven't got to that stage yet with digital social media. Yeah, but the problem is that digital social media claims to be criticizing the mainstream media. In other words, they claim to be the critical voice that you're mm. talking about, mm. okay? You think mm. you're the critical voice. No, you're not necessarily. You're trying to shore up in, in light of what is it's trenchant a, criticism. It's a question any source should be asking itself, and actually if there's one good thing that will come out of this whole post-truth debate and this crisis, is that the, the, the uh, uh, much more self-critical establishment media or mainstream media who are just as responsible for sort of bad reporting 
reporting and biases and all these sorts of things than these, the news sources. So I, th I think they just need to be See, a, a general questioning. See, the tweeters of today are like the Jacobins, right, in the French <laughs> Revolution. It's like, that's what they're like, right? Because yeah. they're the ones who are fundamentally questioning in a very basic way and calling the ancien regime fake and all the rest of it. And of course, in the long term of history, this has been a mixed blessing, right? And people can judge these guys differently, but they don't come out to be quite as stupid as I think a lot of the tweeting. Yeah, and way, I, way, I, way, well, I, mean, I, I can agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. That. Look, we're, we're going through the exact right. same situation right now that we went through when Woodward and Bernstein were going after Richard Nixon. And he was saying the same kinds of things about right. the press back then. The press set itself up in the situation where you ended up with 24-hour news and cable news, which automatically took journalists out of the field and made them go on the air all the time before they had an opportunity to actually dive into a story and get their assignment desks to edit the content and get the real story out there, or at least what they were saying was the real story, precursor to where we are with digital news and dissemination. On the understanding that this is not going to, to change, that yeah. we're not going to have to put it away, it may change in some shape as, as George is suggesting. Do, do any one of you here think that what we're seeing has been um, detrimental to society as a whole? Well, I think the loss, I, I mean, if you start to disagree no. about how to establish, how to see truth and how to establish it and agree what it is, then I think you're in some danger. I don't, I don't think that's a very advanced process. I don't think we're no. in a post-truth society, but truth is under a lot of attack. Miki, you wanted to say something, please do. Well, how do you define truth? I mean, well, we do tolerate actually quite a large... Let, now let, let, let people yes, are very involved in the elections. They, because they're interacting with each other on Facebook and on Twitter, um, we had record turnout in 12 primaries in 2016. I think part of this is because people no longer feel that their vote doesn't matter. They have a voice. Yeah. Well, there is that point. Yeah, actually, their vote Trump doesn't matter in a situation where the, the electoral satellite college. delay makes it all rather no, difficult. I understand. No, no, but, but I, I actually agree, I agree with her point. And I do think that what we're going to be seeing with this with this kind of world is that we're going to see more involvement. It, and, and in fact, look, historically, we've actually tolerated a wide range of opinions. And people, you know, even in ordinary circumstances, have thought about the world in quite different ways, and yet we've been able to live together. It's only in terms yeah. of when we're talking about these kind of crucial things like, you know, presidential elections and specific but, decisions, where everybody has yeah. to, as it were, agree to the outcome, that then this matter matters. But well, you're talking the, democratization very much about is good. societies this is good. which we approve of, in societies which are far more authoritarian. You, you could see this used as a, as a tool against the people, even if the people have the means by which to defend themselves using this tool. It, it's very confusing. That's precisely what's going on in Russia at the moment. I'm in favor of empowerment. I'm in favor of very broad spans of ideas. But there is a difference between a very broad span of ideas and a fundamental disagreement in society about how you establish what's true. And the latter is a dangerous thing. But yeah, and the tool you can is say, not My question be the was problem. asked, what is truth? I'm not saying that there is any solid version of truth, but there are things which we do in using evidence and examining it which get us a little closer to the truth. It's yeah. a constant process. Scientific History method. goes yeah. on, but science, my, my research, scientific science method. research, research I'm, I'm goes on. <laughs> I'm going to give uh, in one of the last yeah. words to Mexico, because he's more of the generation that has sort of seen this come up. Uh, we've lived with the old, now we have to live with, with the new. But this is the new, this is the norm, is it? This is the norm, and I think it's a good thing, despite the dangers. And I, 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 as you said, technology is always neutral. It can be used for good and bad. But I think the short-term gains that some opportunists and some populists are getting from kind of misusing social media or even governments, whether it's Russia or whoever else, I think in the long run, the democratization of opinions and views, the idea that we're no longer deferent to a, a small number of authority voices, the fact that everyone can access information, this has to be a good thing. And uh, the task of the establishment is to equip and empower people but very to, often, to understand things properly. Very often, it is a reinforcement of an idea you already have. Rather than That's looking true. for you need alternatives to get people to out it. of their filter bubbles and keep, out of their keep telling worlds. them something over and over again. Yeah. You're reinforcing the position. It's yeah. not a bad thing, though. Yeah, but I'm not so sure that Russia and China Einstein's are that much different crazy. from the United States. Let's say from the standpoint of the official media. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I just think that there's a sense in which the United the United States is not able to, as it were, control the alternative stuff the way in which the China and Russia might be able to do. I'd but say I, that was a very basic difference. 
Yeah, the okay, division but, but, of powers in a society is what, what those checks and balances are. Rather than to get, you know, overly epistemological about truth and things like this. Sure, sure. Well, such a long word. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that word. It's a great word. It's a great word. Program. That sort of leaves us a little bit stumped. Final word from you, Mika. Oh, my, my final word is that people continue to be extremely engaged with Donald Trump. They don't care about what's going on with the Mueller investigation. Uh, his base hasn't changed their mind about him. The stock market is booming. We've had the ninth record day. <laughs> GDP is up 2.6%. He's added a million jobs. And that His base <laughs> is going true. to stay loyal. Okay. And that is a fact. Yes. <laughs> or is it? That's what we've been wondering here. Listen, thank you all. Mika Mosbacher, thank you very much from the United That's a States. Fact. Very, very early in the morning and very hot there. We appreciate you coming on to Roundtable. To everybody here in the studio, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. It's always been a part of society, what we've been talking about. But has the internet given all of this a life of its own? Uh, you have been watching Roundtable with me, David Foster, and that is a fact. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.